The snow is melting and it's starting to is warm. Is this for the new commercial? This is the new commercial. We're recording. Why is it you always cut guys, me off? Guys, guys, calm down. Let's just start it over. It's too late. We have to start our show, which is Twist, the weekend sports talk, where you can hear banter like this with sports and interviews. Hear us on the RTF Sports Network, Mondays at 8 Eastern. Also, like our page on RTF Sports Network and check us out at rtfsportsnetwork.com. Coming up next here at the 4 p.m. hour is Daily BS with your host, Brian Snow from Snowman in the Morning. Enjoy. De los productores de Betty en New York, Telemundo presenta... ¿Sabes que esto se acabó? ¡Ya! La historia de dos amigas en crisis matrimonial. ¿Sigues con la idea de separarnos? Sí. Y el insólito pacto de un esposo que podría salvar la relación. Vamos a darnos 100 días para ver qué pasa. 100 días para enamorarnos. Una historia que los emocionará, los hará reír, llorar y reflexionar. Estreno esta noche, 98 Centro, por Telemundo. You're tuned in to the Daily BS. Do you believe it? Sports and culture combined into one. Michael on the drive across the lane. Turnaround shot. Got it. 63 for Jordan. Are you kidding me? He did what? The Daily BS begins. Bazinga. <laughs> right now. Hey, googly moogly. Hadouken. Hey, this promises to be fun. Can't wait. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, folks. Brian Snow is here and with you, and we're ready to get down to some daily BS business, sports and culture combined into one. You can hear a replay of this show one hour after its completion, and the premiere of the Daily BS podcast will also be available one hour after this show's completion. We are on all kinds of networks and stations all across the country. Well, Let me use my normal phrase in the region, across the nation and around the world. So if you're in your car on the drive home and you got me via your phone, via your laptop, via whatever, welcome to the Daily BS and let old Brian take you home with some great sports and culture talk. All right. Enough introductions. Let's get started. Okay, so you guys know. I've had some great guests on the program. I will continue to get great guests on the program. And then I got a surprise. The fellow that you're going to hear on the other side of the hotline has a national championship to his credit. And he earned that national championship, and I hope I say this correctly, at the Ohio State University. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's have, right. have to say it right. The Ohio State University. This is Maurice Hall, and he joins me right now. How are you, my friend? Oh, man. Things are good. Things are good. How's everything with you? This coronavirus needs to quit. <laughs> I know. I know. That's right, man. <laughs> crazy out here right now it's it crazy. is how are you ha- how are you handling the shut-in situation oh man you, you know it's uh it's uh it has its days man you know i have three young girls so i have three kids under the under the age of five so <laughs> it, it it gets crazy man it's a lot of a lot of emotion a lot of bickering and uh you know i'm, I'm trying to I'm, i think god has been given me uh, patience during this time because that's all I can have right now. It was rough. <laughs> Man. Three girls under the age of five? Wow. Um, yeah. Four, four, three, and, and 18 months. So, Well, uh, fatherhood it's, it's, just pulled a triple play on you, my friend. <laughs> Man, hat trick for sure. Hat trick for sure. <laughs> Man. How do you... <laughs> How do you handle it with them being not that with them being so young in age and not that far apart in age? How do you handle it? Well, you know, you just got to you just you know, the good part is they're getting to an age where they can kind of play by themselves mm-hmm. or play with each other. Right. Uh the bad part is <laughs> Them playing with each other also results in them arguing or somebody end up crying or you know somebody getting hurt. 
<laughs> literally um, <laughs> at least three or four times an hour. So uh, that is yeah. the that's, so you, there's no getting anything done when they're when they are around. Um, so it is what it is, man. From one father to another, I totally understand that because just when yeah. you think you have a chance to get something done, there's a little one next to you. And you and you have three girls. I too am the parent of a daughter, as well as as well oh, as yeah. a stepdaughter. And when those little ones look at you with those eyes, yeah, it's you, forget it. You can forget it's it rap. because you're not. It's, it's a, a rap, rap man. <laughs> yeah, they. Uh, you know, you can't. I I uh, I knew once after having the first one, I was going to turn into a punk man. I knew it, <laughs> and, and that's exactly what happened. <laughs> And the older they get, it's just like, here's a car key. You know what I mean? Like, whatever car you want. I don't got the money, but I'm going to have to put it on credit for you. You know, it's just what it is. It's crazy. But uh, that's, uh, it, you know, it's hard to say no, man. It, it is hard. It is hard to say no. And yeah. what's going to be even crazier is, like, is when they turn 15 and 16. And right. You gotta beat every boy off with a stick. Man, that's the, you know that's the, that's gonna be the time, the challenging time. My my hope is I can instill in them now, you know the the uh, the discipline and and the right thing to look out for. So I don't have to be that guy, but you know what? I'll be prepared. Never every every father is that guy. If you are the father of a daughter. <laughs> As you are, as I am. If you are the father of a daughter, you are that guy. No matter Man. how many times or how many years you try to instill in your girls, okay, this is what you look for in a man. This is what I have with with your mother. This is And look, you're going to turn into that guy because yeah. when the calls start happening, when the visits start happening, when they get to the age where they start looking at boys, and I do not condone this in any way. I am making a joke, folks. But from one father to another, how many times are you going to go, hey, look, can I have that shotgun over there so I can fend off some boys trying to come <laughs> after my daughters? <laughs> hey, man. Shoot. I'm 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 gonna try to leave it because hey I I feel like they might be uh, they might need to be more more nervous about their mom because <laughs> she is uh, super overprotective so I don't think we I think we'll be good you know <laughs> she already said that she you know she's willing to go to jail so <laughs> uh, you know the it is gauntlet what it is. has been laid down. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of gauntlets, let's let's go back in time, take a stroll down memory lane to the 2002 season. And there's yeah, one game in particular that I want to touch on because I've had Jonathan Wills on before, another former Buckeye. Yeah, I saw, I heard, I heard yeah. the J Dub, J Dub interview. Yeah. You know, that yeah. was that was cool. That was cool. Uh, oh, there's going to be more. There's going to be more Buckeyes on this program. But I, I want to take you back. Let's go back to 2002, take a stroll down memory lane. And the first game I want to look at was the last one of the regular season against that school up north. That's right. Yeah, I, right. Used to live in, I used to live in Columbus. And right. there are two games when Columbus goes upside down. Homecoming and when yep. you know who comes to town. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. For sure. <laughs> Yeah, that was a that was a crazy game, man. It yeah, was, it was. Uh, yeah, it, it was, was exciting, you know, just because of of the magnitude of what the game meant. On top of us being, you know, what twelve and zero at the time. Yeah, so yeah. It was, uh, you know, and and then coming from, uh, you know, just it was so much, so much uh, emotion that was behind it. You know, I think you know this was the the hope that the Ohio State fans had been wanting for so long. You know, mm -hmm. I know when you talk to Jay Dub, where you had so many great teams um, in the 90s mm -hmm. where that that should have been in a national championship and yes. should have beaten, beaten 
uh, that team up north, and for some reason or another, could not get it done. So, yeah, yeah, the, the magnitude of that, and 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 seeing that, like, we're literally almost to the promised land um, with with our rival in the way. It was, it was that that whole week was was stressful. I you bet know? it was. It was, it was pressure. It was it was it was all of that. You yeah, know, from from former players to yep. to fans to I think I think everybody kind of felt it, man. But you know, we prepared really well, and you know, Coach Tress came in and he had already, you know, um, we had beat them obviously the year before his first year. Um, so you know, we already came in with the confidence that you know we could beat them again. You know, especially at home. Right. So it was just a matter. You know, every it felt like destiny with every. You know, I think we had four or five or six close games that we yeah. ended up being able to pull out, and uh, you know, we knew it was going to be a fight. You know, mm-hmm. we going in, and you know, the players that they had, they had had some, some great players that that made some some amazing plays during that game, and um, it was just a matter of you know who who was going to continue to execute, and at the end of the game, so. It was a different hero every week for the 2002 season. It was. When, when y'all it beat was. that school up north, it was one of my favorite games to watch. The other one, and I will just say two words, because the game I'm going to talk about now can be identified <laughs> by two words. Holy yeah, Buckeye. Buckeye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody talks about that Purdue game, man. Yeah. That, was, that was exciting. That and, was it was exciting. A full, and it was a full house at Purdue. I mean, it's oh, a ra- yeah. it's a oh, rarity yeah. now, but it was a full house at Purdue, and right. the, the, and you know the play that produced um, Brent Musburger's comment of "Holy Buckeye!" A gamble on fourth and one, yeah, and they didn't cover yeah. Michael Jenkins. Why? Yeah, that was a horrible decision. <laughs> it was. Horrible decision. It was. It was because Jenkins has been burning had been burning people all season. And right. I knew, I, I knew the folks at Purdue were reminded you got to cover number twelve. They didn't. Yeah, man, it was. Uh, it was. You know, I remember seeing the ball in there. I'm like, oh my goodness, what is going? <laughs> you know, and, and he was going against a cornerback um, who, who I, I don't know well, but we ran track in high school against each other right. in, um, in high school because he was from Ohio as well. Mm-hmm. And and he was a fast guy, but you know to see Mike kind of get past him, and then you know the the ball being thrown perfectly by Craig, man, it was like oh my goodness, it was that was that moment there. I yeah. think was like okay, this is this is real. It is this is real, man. <laughs> we got a chance. Everything's falling into place. And, and those two ga- you know? those two games, I got a third one I want to look at also. Those two games, the final home game of the year, the one where you beat Purdue, and then yeah. an unexpected challenge from Illinois on the road. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it was. Uh, it was. Uh, it was freezing that game. I remember I played the whole <laughs> game, man. And Illinois, I know, I know it was only... freezing in Champaign. It was man, it was freezing. so cold, and <laughs> to the point where. The they Illinois had a um like the bench that you sit on. Yes. Was heat was a heated bench. Yes, it was. And like there were uh there were things uh like in be- that were cut in between so you could put your hands inside of it to like warm your hands up. Yes. And that was the best thing ever and I was still free. <laughs> but, you know, it was we 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 made some good plays and we didn't really execute that well that game. Mm-hmm. Um honestly and which is why it was probably so close. Uh, and, you know, fortunately, you know, we when we went down to the wire, we were able to really make some plays and, yep. and obviously score a touchdown and, and overtime in order to really pull that off, man. But yeah. Illinois came, you know, and we, and we knew it. You know, everybody who we were playing against were going to give us their best, especially down when we were later on in the season and they saw that we were getting a lot of, recognition you know everybody was mm-hmm. coming out to kind of knock us off man so illinois played well and they they played with uh, a lot of steam and and thought they were going to do something 
Maurice Hall joining me here on the program, uh, taking a stroll down memory lane. Man, you got to take me to Tempe, Arizona, January yeah. 2003, the national championship, and you're playing against the U. You're playing against, playing against Miami. You. <laughs> playing against the, the greatest team in history. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It was, it was, you know, I was, it was so surreal because, you know, coming from, like, we went to the Outback Bowl the year before, Tampa, mm-hmm. Florida. Mm-hmm. Um, we went down there uh, December 19th, didn't play till January 1st. <laughs> so that was the absolute worst trip in history, right? So we were, we were doing two practices a day, hitting – you know, it, it was freezing one day, <laughs> then it's sunny the next. Right. And we're, you know, we're, it was like, man, what is going on? What are we doing here? We're here for Christmas. We're here for New Year's Eve. I mean, what kind I'm of like, vortex is going? What kind of vortex is what? going on in Texas, man? man. <laughs> for, for for the Outback Bowl? Come yeah. On. For uh, Tampa, I beg your pardon. What kind of stuff is going on in right. Tampa? You freeze exactly. one minute, you're warm the next. And by the time Man. you get situated, you're like, wait a minute, it, does my body know how to react to this? Exactly, exactly. But when we got off that plane in Tempe, man, and there was so many people there at the at the uh, airport mm-hmm. and, you know, hand, handing out hats and, yep. and Tostito chips. And <laughs> it was a totally different, uh, it was a totally different experience, man. We, it was it was like, man, we are, we've arrived, you know, yes. we, we were here to, <laughs> to, to put in some work and, mm-hmm. and, you know, then, then going to, uh, the Scottsdale princess hotel where it was like a resort and you're like, what is this? <laughs> and so we, we felt like, you know, we felt like movie stars, man. Right. It was, it was so crazy. And, you know, the, the great part was so many Buckeye fans came to support, that it felt like home, man. It's yeah. like everywhere we it went, felt, it, it was felt like, like the horseshoe. Buckeyes were <laughs> there. It was. It was like, man, this is this is yeah. such an amazing feeling, and it, man, it just like preparing the, it for felt like the, it felt like know, the horseshoe because there did. were more Ohio State fans than Miami fans, and I watched. Oh, I, I got. I, I got that game in its original broadcast format. Y'all know I'm a broadcast head. I have that game in its original for- broadcast format. Keith Jackson and Dan Fouts were on the call. There were oh, more yeah. Buckeye fans than Miami fans. And oh, the overconfidence definitely. of the Hurricane fans was there. That's why they didn't turn out in droves. Buckeye yeah, fans? Yeah, I mean, you know, which, which is understandable because they're like, well, we, we've been winning like this yeah. for years. Yeah, been there, you done know, They I, have the attitude of been there, done that. Buckeye fans, right. they came – prepared they said oh, we're going to see a national championship game and a national championship win which brings right. which brings this talk about the leadership of one craig krenzel yeah yeah craig man craig really craig was always a leader you know he was always you know he was he was he was quieter you know freshman year because you know steve was kind of the guy and steve steve you know, everybody knew about Steve and Steve mm-hmm. had the experience. And once, once Craig really stepped in, especially, you know, that 2002 year, yeah. you know, I, everybody kind of took to him, especially because Craig made so many um, plays yes. to, that, that really helped us get out of situation with his feet or, you know, whatever, um, that we trusted him. We trusted him. We knew that if, if, we got in a bind that somehow Craig was going to help us save that, save that play. And you could and see it. You could see it and all you could see year. It. You, you know, could see it the super, entire season. Super smart guy. Season. Exactly. And, and he just, he played like a veteran. So going to that game, you know, we were all young, you know, it was, you know, it was a full of, full of juniors and sophomores. And, um, but we had we had battled that whole year, you know. We were we had yeah. battled thirteen games where everybody had given us their best, and now we're going up against the best. Yeah, and we just knew, you know, we were going to have to lean on that leadership of Craig and and obviously Dawson, Donnie, and yep, and so many other of the other players on the team that that had seen 
and been a part of big games like this. So, uh, but Craig, he was he was uh, definitely second to none. I wouldn't trade him for a quarterback for any other quarterback no. during that year. No. Well, with the draft coming up this week, what kind of advice can you offer to the young man that might have their name called, whether it's round one or round seven? Yeah, I, I mean, well, I mean, the the crazy part is the obviously the earlier rounds, the the more secure things are for you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're talking about Chase Young, you're talking about Joe Burrow. You know, those guys projected to be top top five picks. Um, you know, their their life's obviously going to change financially. Oh, yeah. um, the expectation is going to increase. We're paying you a lot more money, so we're expecting you to do the things you need to do um, in order to be great or be as great as we think you can be. Yeah. And I think that's the one thing um, college kids have to – make sure they understand because once you get to the league, man, it's not, you know, there's, you know, there's organized, you know, practice, but outside of that, it's kind of up to you Mm -hmm. to make sure you're eating right. And it's kind of up to you to make sure you're, you're working out properly and doing everything you need to do. Cause you know, in college, you know, everything's kind of structured. And then once you get to the league, you know, it's, it's, it's on you, you know, so you have to make sure you have that discipline going into it where you can, set yourself up to be successful. Now, once you go to, now you're talking about the later round, you know, your fifth, sixth, seventh round, even, you know, free agents, you know, it's a, it's a different look because now you have to go in there and really prove yourself because basically they're saying that, you know, you, uh, we think you have potential, but we're not, we're not sold yet, you know? Right. And that's a matter of, you know, now you're going in there and you're competing against guys who are already there who already probably been there for a couple of years that might have been on, um, you know, injury reserve or might have been on just scout team or uh, the practice squad that are also trying to make the team. And um, you just have to go in there. You got to work hard. You got to really do as much, do even more, in my opinion, than, than, you know, maybe the first or second round guys because they're looking, when they're looking to make cuts, you're the first person they're going to be looking at. So, it's up to you to, to show that you can do something different than somebody else in order to you know, give them a reason to, to want to keep you on the roster. So you made a gigantic leap from your football career to an acting career and pursued yeah. it the same way you pursued football. What took you to um, what took you to pursue acting? So, well, it kind of it kind of happened where I was. So I was in Columbus. Once I, I finished with the Chargers, I decided I was going to go back to school and be an athletic director because they get paid a lot of money. So I said, I'm going to do that. <laughs> Working under Gene Smith, and Gene's making, you know, I think at the time Gene was making like six, seven hundred thousand a year, and I yeah. was like, what? Done. Right, you know, and then so I, I went and got my master's while I was working under him. At the same time, I was working as a sports analyst for the local NBC affiliate. Mm-hmm. And as I started doing that and started, you know, reporting on obviously Ohio State, the Columbus Blue Jackets, and and the the Browns and the Bengals, um, I got a chance to really get comfortable in front of the camera. And then I also did a high school show called Football Friday Night where. You know, we started doing skits to make it more fun for the the actual show. Right. And the skits really turned into um, its own thing where it became like the most popular high school show, you know, in the state. So that kind of led me to say, oh, man, this seems this is this is kind of fun, you know, and maybe I should just see what this is about. And I end up starting. I took an acting class and literally that first day I took that acting class, I had that same passion that I had for football growing up, you know, that passion of like, man, I could literally do this forever if, and without even getting paid, if if I could, you know, and that's when I realized it was, that was the next thing. And thankfully, you know, it took me, it took me a couple of years to get there. But once I got there, you know, that was what I felt like I had to move towards. And, 
you know, I knew it wasn't going to happen in Columbus at the time. Mm -hmm. So I said, I gotta, I gotta go where it's happening. And fortunately I was, I was able to to get out to LA where I am now. And that was, what that was almost 11 years ago now. And, you know, been fortunate and, and blessed to, to, have an opportunity to be on some, some TV shows and some movies and, and, and now also, you know, write, write and produce some of my own stuff that, you know, I'm super proud of and, That's um, awesome. you know, trying to make it in this business, man. I, that is so awesome. And I am so blessed to have you on my program and I share the same dream because I have been told many times over, I wouldn't succeed as a broadcaster and yet, this coming August right. officially will start my 25th year in broadcasting. Wow. Seven of them as a That's sports huge. talk host. I've done play-by-play for 24 years. And <clears throat> one thing my wife has repeatedly said to me, she said, don't worry about the money you should have made. Worry about what you can do now in season 25 mm-hmm. and let seasons 1 through 24 and I started good. thinking. I started thinking about. This. I'm so excited to get to season 25. Not many. When you strike out on your own, not many get yeah. this far because they uh, either sure. because they either quit or give up, yeah, or they 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 let the dream die. And I right. and I'm right. not letting this die. And it's the same with yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, man. No, gotta gotta keep it going. And you know, there's obviously as the the, the longer you go, the the more things that come up, you know, but you have to really, if, if there's something that, that's truly you're passionate about, you got to keep it going, man. But, you, you know, it, it, things do get harder when you get married. When I started this, I was, I was single and no kids, you know, now you're talking <laughs> about married coming up on seven years, three kids. And, you know, obviously those things, you know, ha- have to take more, more priority than what they're, what you're used to doing. And right. And a lot of times, you know, people people fall on into, well, I'm just going to do this, and I'm a I'm a I'm a sacrifice this to do this. But, you know, I think the great part is you have a great support system, you know, with your wife who who who's definitely supportive of it, which I think helps so much. It is, and it does. Um, it does. because of that, you know, it allows you to really get that time and that space to to do you know, that thing that's inside you that encourages you to make a difference. And that's what you're doing, man. So congrats to you. Hey, best to you too. Thanks for coming on. And I hope to have you on quite a few times because I suspect college football will be back. So I'm going to sneak in. I know, I know I have a national nationally syndicated program, but doggone if I don't get some Buckeye talking, some big 10 talk on, on with you. I'd love to have you. I'd love to have I leave you with this. 2004 was your last season at Ohio State, and yep. as as much as I love the Bucks, I'm from Chicago, and my team is the Northwestern Wildcats. I had yeah. a friend call. I had a friend call me, and said, "You know Ohio State's playing Northwestern, right?" I said, "You mean the <laughs> six the six ranked Buckeyes?" And this is 2004. The six ranked Buckeyes are playing Northwestern, and he goes, "Yeah, it's at night, and it's at Ryan yep. Field. What?" Yep. I said, all right, I'm not working. I'm not doing anything. I'm going to get a bunch of snacks, and I'm going to be glued to the television. <laughs> <laughs> and then NU gets out, to a, gets out to a big lead, and I wasn't comfortable. My dad came upstairs, and he said, how do you, how do you explain this? I said, Dad, I'm not comfortable. He says, why? You see that number six in front of Ohio State? They're the sixth-ranked team in the country. That means yeah. it's a sixty-minute game. Little di- sure. so it, it it got tied. It was tied twenty-seven apiece. <clears throat> it went to it, it went to overtime. Ohio State missed a field goal kick, and I'm going. How did he yeah. miss that? I and know. I started I getting I started getting real nervous because my cat <laughs> my cats had the ball. Brett Bazinet was the quarterback at the time. Yeah, got yep. down to the fi- got down to the five yard line, and I froze in front of the television. My dad just peeked <laughs> in and goes, "You were saying, like, Dad, shut up." 
I know you're right. I was confident, <laughs> but shut up. He came in with me, and I had the WGN call as well as the feed on ESPN. And then Noah Heron broke the plane and won yeah, the game, man. and I lost it. I went nuts. That was, that was crazy. <laughs> I remember that. I remember that. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh my god that was rough that was rough I bet. We, had, we had it we had it but, uh, I, I thought you, you guys know, were going to come were... back and steal it being the big bad Buckeyes and I, I love, yep, I love yep. the Buckeyes don't get me wrong I love the Buckeyes Absolutely. I love my cat I love my cats but I love the Buckeyes and I respect the Buckeyes but that yeah. game I must have put on right. in the next month I must have put on about 25 pounds because I bet like four <laughs> different I bet like four different dinners from people oh, man. and they can, <laughs> they called me and they said how did you know this was going to happen and I'm yeah, not, I wasn't going to tell them I was standing in front of the television nervous off my rear end are you kidding me I'm not giving that away <laughs> Right, but they, right, but they knew. exactly. They, they knew. They they knew because when they when when they bought the dinners, then they said, "How nervous were you?" I said, "Extremely," which explains why I yeah. don't have any hair on my head right now because I'm bald. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no, oh, Northwestern man. played well that year. I actually visited Northwestern out of high school. I went on an official visit there. Really? And uh, yeah, man. You know, Damian Anderson was. You yeah. know, he had just had an amazing year. And oh man! I went there and I was like, man, maybe, maybe I'm. I could be the next Damian Anderson here. But then I was like, man, Northwestern. I just man. don't know if they're going to be consistent. Yeah. You know, from a winning standpoint. So, well, but uh, yeah, that was great. Three great coaches in line: Gary Barnett, yeah. and then Randy Walker, True. and now Pat Fitz Pat Fitzgerald. Pat Gerald, serious. He's a beast, <laughs> man. He's a beast. Pat Fitzgerald was a beast on the field, and he's doggone a beast as a coach. Absolutely. They could not have picked Absolutely. a better. They could not have picked a better candidate to run the Northwestern football team. Than Pat Fitzgerald. That's for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> that is oh for man, sure. it's so much fun talking with you. I can't wait to have you on again. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me, man. Got some more stuff for you, folks. Stick around. I'll be back in a flash.
You're tuned in to the Daily BS. Sports and culture combined into one. So, I have... Wait, try again. Try again. Three, two, one. So, I have spoken to a lot of people about the recent happenings. We like to call them the NFL Draft. And a couple people commented it kind of feels like a game because we haven't had any live games in a while. William Morgan, who's a Saints fan and the man in charge of the Sports Report, now joins me. How are you, brother? Hey, how you doing, man? Thanks for having me back. Thanks for thanks for coming back, number one. Number two, did the draft feel like it was like sports was back in a way for you? It did. And I also like the way they made it sort of kind of personal by going into the people's songs. I, I like that, too. Yeah, yeah, I really like that. Let's begin with your Saints, the kings of the NFC South. What? <laughs> Man. I don't, I don't even have to, complete, I don't have to complete the question to know your response to it because we talked on and off Friday night. Mm-hmm. Man, the only thing I can think of with that first pick, the only thing I can think of that even made that pick happen, we got killed up the middle by the Vikings in that one playoff loss yeah. that we had at, at yeah. the end of the season. So, and Larry Wartford, it looks like his time is coming up with us. So, I'm, I'm even maybe looking at a trade. Mm-hmm. And um, that he will be his replacement because he will be – if you just sign Pete back, so you can't cut Pete. You can't cut penalties, Pete. <laughs> so, it look, <laughs> so it looks like it's going to be Larry Walker, who's probably going to either trade it or let go, in my opinion. Because his, his play ha- has declined. Mm-hmm. Seriously declined. So that's my opinion. Now, I do like what we did by trading up to address the need. Yeah. To get the linebacker that we, that we so-called, that we – me that we covered it so badly. Yes. Um, but the thing that kills me, Sean Payton and this <laughs> LSU <laughs> Patrick Queen was right there. Yes, he, he was. He was right there. And I don't know what it is. Um, and y'all rumor has it. And y'all didn't get him. Patrick rumor Queen was it, right he, there. He was right there. Do you remember you remember Katrina? Yes. And what I'm what I'm thinking the reason why Peyton hates LSU so much is because LSU would not let the Saints use their practice facility during Hurricane Katrina. Right. So from that point forward, if you look back, they haven't the last LSU person we drafted or player we drafted was Deborah Henderson. Mm-hmm. From that point forward, no no players from LSU. None. So you know. I don't know what we're doing in the third round. I mean, Trotman, he didn't perform <laughs> well in, in the combine. He, what, he he didn't even look like an average athlete in the combine. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe some Peyton feels he can coach him up or whatever. He looks great against low-level competition, uh, but I don't know what that turnaround means when he goes up against NFL defenses. And then t- round seven. <laughs> Bro, Tommy <laughs> Stevens, the man has thrown 202 passes in his college career. Yep. If you make him the number seven, Moss was still, Randy Moss's kid was still on the board yeah, at that Thad- point. Thaddeus Moss was, was still there. Yeah, you could have took Thaddeus in the third instead of Troutman. If you're looking for a project, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I know Bleacher Report had Troutman. I know Bleacher Report said kind of had Troutman rated kind of high um, because a lot of people are saying he's like a poor man's um, George Kittle. But that can't uh, be. That can't be because there's only one George Kittle, and Marcus Williams got a face full of him up close and personal in the Superdome last year. Yeah. So I man, I, I don't know what the Saints are doing, man. I don't know. The only thing. Maybe trading Warford, or we can get compensate the um, compensatory pick uh, for Carolina for Teddy Bridgewater. 
maybe that's something that's in the works. Maybe, you know, maybe the front office can find a, a you know, a gym in the rough. But outside of that, I, after those first two picks, man. <laughs> Man, I, I read some of your I read some of your complaints um, on on social media. Meanwhile, the team that I follow and have loved for many years, the 49ers, to say the least, were quite busy. That team, you let go of Breida. Mm hmm. But you did. But you did pick up Trent Williams. Yep. And then you trade Godwin. Yeah. I, I don't know what. I'll tell you exactly. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what they're doing. I will tell yeah. you exactly what they're doing. Godwin's use ran out in yeah. San Francisco, and I hate saying that because I love seeing him play. But now you see what kind of offense the Forty ers have put together especially now with Joe Staley retiring and Trent Williams coming in, Breida played himself out. Same with Godwin. Now, I hate saying that about Godwin and Breida because I was the biggest fan of Matt Breida when he, when he came to San Francisco. But when you can't hold on to the ball and you can't stay healthy and you're, in a, and you're on a team that's going to be beyond competitive for a long time and yeah. basically Raheem Mostert and Tevin Coleman ran Breida out of town they ran him out and I was that's true too that's true too and also they did pick up two receivers in the draft so maybe that's why Mike Juwan, out. Je, Juwan Jennings out of Tennessee mm-hmm. they snatched him yeah. they snatched the Brandon Ayuk out of Arizona State and Ayuk is a poor man's John Taylor and anybody who remembers yep. the 49ers from back in the day remembered the sneaky talent John Taylor had. So now you get yep. Samuel on, you get Debo on one side, Ayuk on another. Remember, Jalen Hurd is still in the wings because he was injured last year with a back injury. And I just don't see That's the 49ers true. parting with a six foot six wide receiver that can run routes and is hand strong and very strong the way Jalen Hurd is. I'm excited to see how this offense blends together. But I will say, do not be surprised if the 49ers pick up one more running back who wasn't drafted that insert him into that system, and he's going to be dangerous. Yeah. The team that gets me that I have no idea what they're doing are the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> what in the world Jordan Love. are you doing? Jordan Love? What are you, what are you doing? <laughs> It, it, it. Everybody's got to have an heir apparent, and yep. I get that. I understand yeah. that. Yeah. But at the, but at the same point, they didn't draft not one single receiver. None. None. I, I guess they're depending on Devonte Adams, and Devonte Adams got shut down in Santa Clara last January. When yeah. everybody said, "Listen." Let's go back to the NFC Championship game. The 49ers were an unproven commodity going into that championship game in terms of playoff games for a while. I understand that. The Packers were a proven commodity with everyone that's come through Green Bay in the past five years. I understand that. But at the same time, the Packers, I don't think the Packers took the 49ers seriously. That might have been the case. That might have been the case. And no one's taking the 49ers seriously again with all the moves they made. They weren't dangling. If you read the reports, and I know you did, you know, you do a great job with the sports report. It was put out there that the 49ers were willing to trade D. Ford and Quan Alexander for picks. No, they weren't going to do that. If you believe that, a big time smokescreen. Mm-hmm. A big time smoke screen. They're going to sign them to long term deals because those were two of the heavy hitters in that defensive lineup. And now, yep. with the 49ers snatching DeForest Buckner's heir apparent in Javon Kinlaw, you get four first yep. rounders across the front line again. Everybody returns healthy, and that savage defense can become even more savage. 
Exactly. Exactly. I want to tell you another team that I was that I was impressed with in the draft. That's the Baltimore Ravens. Yes. Really impressed with what they did in this draft. Oh my goodness. Queen is right there. Dobbins. Oh man. Um Duvernay from Texas. Very, very happy with what they did in the draft. Yeah, JK oh, Do- JK Dobbins is going to be a monster. And now yep. you give you give Lamar Jackson the running back that he needed. He needed it last year, and he didn't have it. Mm-hmm. Nope. Nope. I mean, now you give him somebody that can actually go out there, catch passes, be nimble in space. Look, I miss Mark Ingram, don't get me wrong, but nimble in space is something he's just not. And, mm-hmm. and, the, Ravens re- and the Ravens really needed that. And for them to get that in round two – and be a and be a playoff team, yeah. They they, they did it right. <laughs> yeah, they they really did. Who, they really bes- did. Besides the really Packers, what they did. besides the Packers. No, let's 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 just get the big old elephant in the room. That of course Rob Gronkowski is now in Tampa, along mm-hmm. with Tom Brady, and everybody who thinks they're a Buccaneer fan says that the Buccaneers will A, win the NFC South, I say not, and B, mm-hmm. are Super Bowl contenders, and I say not. I'm sorry, but two big problems I see with Tampa Bay. One, they haven't shored up their secondary, and two, mm-hmm. and they still haven't addressed this, they don't have a running game. Not a consistent I'm not, one. I, yeah, yeah, you, you, hit the, you hit the nail right on the head. I am not a Ronald Jones fan at all. Um, he'll have a, a big week every other week, um, but I'm not a big Ronald Jones fan at all. It was nice to see that they did try to shore up their offensive line somewhat. Their offensive line last year was terrible. It was porous. Um, it was absolutely yeah, porous. Was, yep. And to see them trade up the, to address that somewhat was very, very good. But I'm still not a Ronald Jones fan. Mm-hmm. I think the secondary is I think the secondary is still leaky. Um and Brady's not the most nimble of foot back there. He can move around a little bit, but he no. I don't think he has it anymore. Um I said it when it first happened. I think they'll make the playoffs, maybe get to the second round and that'd be about it. If they get to the second round, I'll be surprised. Do you count them as a playoff team? Absolutely, because you got one of the greatest ever to do it. But mm-hmm. at the same at, at the same time, if they don't fix the problems that's in front of them, what good is this two year deal going to do? Yeah, yeah. And plus, another thing, you can't count on Rob Gronkowski to be healthy healthy the whole year either. Right. You you He's can't, got injury history. You can't count on Rob Gronkowski to be George Kittle. I'm sorry, yep. but Gronkowski was the best tight end in the NFL for a number of years, but now you got folks like Travis Kelsey and George Kittle that have supplanted him. They've supplanted yep. him. Yep. Yep, yep. Yeah. William Morgan of the Sports Report joining me for his quick breakdown of the Saints draft. I plan to have him on later in the week, and, yes, we're going to get some hoop talk in because there are a few things happening with the NBA. We're going to talk about that later in the week. Thanks a lot, my friend. Appreciate the time. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me.
tuned in to the Daily BS. Sports and culture combined into one. The one and only Mike DeBate from Full Press Coverage joins me. How are you, my friend? I'm doing very well, my friend. Thank you so much for uh, having me uh, on your show this morning and uh, talking a little NFL draft and the uh, the aftermath of what was an interesting weekend in the NFL. Interesting to say the least. Let's uh, let's 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 dive right in. Big trade happened between the Redskins and the 49ers. Uh, first of all, let's I say a happy retirement to one Joe Staley, the Longtime left tackle of the 49ers who graced the number 74 a la Steve Wallace. And he's riding off into the sunset uh, after playing two Super Bowls. But then Trent Williams is now welcome to San Francisco. You talk about a move. They get a seven-time Pro Bowler to replace a six-time Pro Bowler. So that position is ta- is taken care of. And we all know who they selected with the 13th pick. The floor is yours, Mike. Absolutely. And with the 13th pick, you know, we called this a couple of weeks ago, and and you really called it before even I did, and that Javon Kinlaw would be the selection at number 13, a la 14 for the the San Francisco 49ers. And to me, this this pick made so much sense. I saw a lot of vitriol being thrown at it over the weekend Mm -hmm. about, oh, well, value, and, you know, they drafted him too high, and Believe me, being up here in New England, I know all about vitriol being thrown at picks for <laughs> picks that are thrown at guys for you know I'm allegedly taking someone too high in. This. Right. Look, San Francisco used the 14 pick on Javon Kinlaw. To me, he's a massive athlete, a singular athlete. I believe he's going to replace DeForest Buckner quite well. I really like uh, the fit that he has in San Francisco. I don't really care about what pundits are going to say about certain fits and where you should take this guy and oh he should be uh he's he's a second rounder or he's a late first rounder you can put a draft grade uh all you want on people what matters is the team that takes him and obviously they felt that he was worth that selection and i think san francisco is going to uh you know do very well with that and go quite nicely along with it then they trade up from 31 to 25 they take brandon Ayuk again another selection that a lot of people were scratching their heads about. I don't understand why. I think Ayu uh, develops. He's, he's very, very big, great impact player after the catch. Uh, I think he fits very nicely in a Kyle Shanahan's offense. I think the cost to move up six spots was a wash. I really do. Some people might think it was too expensive, but I like uh, San Francisco's aggressiveness in this draft. They obviously put targets on these people, and they pulled the trigger on them. And I think that's going to reap uh, uh, some benefits for them. And I think they're really going to end up doing well. They're going to do very, very well, especially with the pieces that they have in place. You and I have talked very much about Javon Kinlaw. And, you know, people say, you know, we should get the 49ers should get receivers to replace Emmanuel Sanders. Look, this was a receiver deep draft, very, very deep with receivers. The 49ers had their pick. Of course, the talk was uh, C.D. Lamb. But I like the way that they snatched Brandon Ayuk. And then on Saturday, I love the way that they snatched Jawan Jennings out of Tennessee. I love the way they snatched Jawan Jennings. Again, another high-impact player that can make a really diff- a real difference on this team. And I love the way he fits in with the culture and with the, um, the ability for the 49ers to be able to move forward. One pick that I think I, I was really going to pay dividends for them alongside a guy like George Kittle and that's Charlie Warner. Yes. Sixth round. Very good blocker. Uh, tremendous tight end. Somebody that I had looked at as a possibility for the Patriots. You know that that was a big position of need for them going into this draft. I really believe that he's a better receiver than he's gotten the opportunity to show when he was at Georgia. And I think he's going to be a nice fit in this offense, especially alongside a guy like, uh, um, uh, alongside a guy like Kittle. So I love the Warner pick. I do love the Jennings pick. Again, I think San Francisco, top to bottom, had a very good draft. And, and I can't understand why some people are not as high on it as, as I've been. I, I, I like what they did in just about every aspect of the, the other choices that they made. One thing I said to you over the course of the weekend, the 49ers are still playing chess while the rest of the NFC is playing checkers, filling out their immediate need, yes. But if you look at the 49ers and how... They have been built, especially since John Lynch took over as GM and Kyle Shanahan took over as the coach. They're not just building for now. They're building for the long term. 
yeah, they really are building for the long term. And I think a pick like this, um, you know, with Kinwa in mind, uh, I think, uh, you know, going with Ayuk in the latter part of the first round. And then as you saw how the draft progressed for them, this is a team that is not making any uh, apologies for contending and contending right now. They're going to do that. That's their primary focus. But the players that they picked up are going to allow them to remain in contention for quite some time. San Francisco got a lot better this weekend, and I really think a lot of teams in the NFC need to keep, uh, take note of that, especially as we move toward the 2020 season beginning. I want to keep an eye. I want y'all to keep an eye on this name out of Washington. He was signed by the 49ers as an undrafted free agent, Salvan Ahmed. The 49ers sent Matt Breida to Miami for a couple of picks. They also sent Marquise Goodwin packing. He's off to Philadelphia. And, you know, some of 49er fans I spoke to got worried. Then we selected Javon Jennings. But keep your eye on this fellow. Salvan Ahmed could become another in the long line of jackknife running backs that the 49ers made famous. That is such a perfect way to describe him. And you turned me on to him a little bit last night, and I did my due diligence on him a little today. I actually really like this pickup as an undrafted free agent. You mentioned the type of a Jack Knight running back. I think that's such a, an apropos term because he does. He's the type of guy that can run north to south. He can go east to west if he needs to. If he needs to pick up yardage, he is very capable of being able to go horizontal before he goes lateral. I like this kid for them. I think he's uh, going to, uh, to bring them a lot. Look, Breda was one of those types of workhorse backs that I don't know if he ever really necessarily got a chance to, uh, you know, uh, fall into his own last year. I think he was overshadowed a little bit, but there's still a lot left in the tank for him. I like that if he's going to go somewhere, he's going to Miami, going to play under a system under Brian Flores, who knows how to utilize those types of backs that may not always make the flashy play, but they're always going to be there for the handoff, and they're always going to give you 110%. So good landing spot for Breda uh, going to Miami, but uh, I really like this pickup for San Francisco, and he's someone definitely I'm going to keep a sharp eye on in training camps, uh, and as the roster building progresses, I think this could get very interesting in San Francisco. Absolutely. Salvan Ahmed will be a perfect complement for that 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 running tandem and it's going to be it's going to be another triple play of running backs Mostert I believe will begin as the starter Tevin Coleman of course will be beside him use check your fullback Werner can work as the H-back you know the tight end you talked about out of Georgia Salvan Ahmed is going to make some noise in San Francisco I just really feel it keep your eyes on him I want to look at the number six 